This audio book is entitled How to Protect Yourself During the Coming Depression and Third World War. The author is Dr. Peter David Beter, a widely respected international financial and legal consultant and political economist. He has published several conventional books, including a current bestseller entitled The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, published by George Braziller, Incorporated, New York. As a political economist, Dr. Beter concerns himself with the human element, the hidden forces behind the scenes which, in his view, are largely responsible for major events. Based on information from confidential sources, Dr. Beter has made correct public predictions months in advance of such events as the resignations of Vice President Spiro Agnew and President Richard Nixon, as well as the vice presidential nomination of Nelson Rockefeller. Recently, he became famous as the man whose charges, publicly as well as in congressional testimony, led to an unprecedented gold inspection visit to Fort Knox by congressmen and newsmen on September 23, 1974. Dr. Bader's professional background includes the practice of general law in Washington, D.C. from 1951 to 1961. During that time, he won all except the first of the more than 1,000 cases he handled. From 1958 to 1961, he was also general counsel to the American Gold Association. In 1961, President Kennedy appointed him counsel to the United States Export-Import Bank, where he served until 1967. In 1968, Dr. Beter accepted the position of the major developer of international business for the Republic of Zaire, formerly the Belgian Congo. He is a member of the Bankers Club of America, the Judicature Society, and the Royal Commonwealth Society of London. He is also listed in the current editions of Who's Who in the East, the Blue Book of London, and the 2000 Men of Achievement, London. In addition to his other activities, Dr. Beter is now chairman of the recently formed American Patriots Committee. In this capacity, he is trying to actively combat the forces which, in his view, are destroying America. Dr. Beter welcomes inquiries in that connection and can be contacted at the American Patriots Committee, 1629K, the letter K Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 2006. Part 1. The Ruling American Dynasty. My friends, there is in America a group of wealthy, very powerful people whose actions behind the scenes determine America's destiny. This group is largely dependent upon and controlled by an incredibly powerful family empire which began over 100 years ago and which has grown steadily ever since. Plans and projects of this family empire are handed down and carried on from one generation to the next, making it a true dynasty. It is this dynasty, regardless of whom we elect, that now rules America. You may already know who I mean by this ruling dynasty. I have identified them in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, and also in numerous radio and television talk shows all over America and from time to time other individuals and groups also state who they are. But in case you don't know who they are, I'm not going to tell you at this point, though you may be able to guess who they are later on. Why not tell you now? Because if you were born any time in the 20th century, you have been the victim of a steadily building, powerful, yet subtle public relations campaign all your life to give the dynastic family a spotless philanthropic image, and especially an image that gives no hint of their awesome wealth and naked power. It is crucial that you grasp the situation you are confronted with so that you can protect yourself. 
and if I give you the dynasty's name at the outset, you may be blinded to the true facts, perhaps saying, Who? Them? It can't be. Everyone knows what fine people they are. Indeed, this was my own reaction years ago when, in the course of my international consulting activities, I was first alerted to the disastrous plans the dynasty had for America, and it was only the weight of more evidence than I have time to relate here that convinced me of the dynasty's true nature. The founder of the dynasty began his career with modest means in the mid-1800s, but became America's first billionaire before the turn of the century, thanks to cutthroat business tactics that by that time had made the family name a nationwide synonym for ruthlessness greed, and corruption. Indeed, this problem had become such a liability for the dynasty that by the late 1800s the dynasty's founder had begun the practice of donating sums of money to various charitable causes, always with as much publicity as possible, in an effort to make the family appear more favorably in the public eye. In 1913 he established what was to become the first of a series of tax-exempt foundations, ostensibly for philanthropic purposes. Incidentally, 1913 was also the same year uh, that the special interests of the dynasty in Congress succeeded in bringing the Federal Income Tax into being, a tax to which the well-funded Foundation was, of course, totally immune. Such an income tax had twice been declared unconstitutional during the late 1800s, but no matter. They simply changed the Constitution by amendment, as they have repeatedly done since to suit their purposes. From the birth of our Republic until 1913, a period of 130 years, only five amendments beyond the Bill of Rights had been needed to keep our country functioning smoothly. Since 1913, however, we have had ten more amendments twice the number in half the time. They always say the Constitution works. Of course it does for them. Moreover, to capitalize on this deteriorating situation which they themselves have brought about, they now have a surprise ready to spring upon the American people as soon as it suits their purposes. A Constitutional Convention in which our Constitution can be scrapped completely and a new one written that suits the dynasty. Quietly and probably unnoticed by you, the authority for the President to call such a Convention has now been ratified by the required number of States under dynastic pressure, and now sits as a time bomb ready to explode what is left of our tattered Free Republic. If you don't believe this, just go to your library and do some newspaper research for the late 1960s and early 1970s. Returning to 1913, that was also the year that the dynasty perpetrated one of their biggest swindles in getting Congress to ignore warnings of our Founding Fathers and create the private central banking system known as the Federal Reserve System. The dynasty-controlled Federal Reserve is up to its eyeballs in responsibility 
for the cancerous conditions which are eating at the vitals of our economy, and I will comment further on that later. The income tax and Federal Reserve matters were bad enough, but the United States Congress in 1913 was vastly more concerned about the dangers to America of the dynasty supposedly philanthropic foundation. Indeed, so afraid and suspicious was the Congress that the dynasty, flexing all the muscles it had at that time, failed utterly for four years in a row to obtain a United States Charter for the Foundation. So complete was Congressional opposition that the dynasty finally gave up. They settled for a State Charter when the Foundation was established in 1913. Benefiting from 60 years of suave public relations, the Foundation today wears the philanthropic halo in the public eye that the dynasty wanted it to have, contributing to the dynasty's public-spirited image. In actuality, however, the Foundation has proven the fears of Congress to have been fully justified. After some initial projects that were designed to allay public fears, the Foundation turned its efforts, efforts ever more fully in subversive directions, undermining in every possible way the natural resistance of Americans to their gradual conquest by the dynasty. In addition, the Foundation has proven an ideal tool for interlocking the activities of their controlled corporations both through Foundation ownership of shares in the corporations and through service of corporate officers as directors of the Foundation. The wealth of the fa dynasty has grown by leaps and bounds, and today their original Foundation is only one of many that they control, all of which are used in the same way. They control over 300 of the world's largest multinational corporations, using hundreds of nominees and other devices to conceal the bulk of their economic might. For example, they control all the world's largest oil companies, and the trust-busting era, as you know, was only a temporary setback. Based on reliable estimates of just the visible wealth of the dynasty, published in 1921 and 1938, it is possible to arrive at an estimate of the dynasty's net worth today in 1974. There is every reason to suspect that the figure obtained this way is a gross underestimate, but it is nevertheless a mind-boggling $50 billion or thereabouts. This figure represents merely a very normal growth rate for their visible wealth in 1938. Yet in their public statements they profess to be worth only around $500 million, still a larger sum than you or I can imagine but only one one-hundredth of what they are conservatively estimated to really be worth. Their bashfulness about their money is not due to modesty. It's because their power is most secure if the man on the street does not know how powerful they are. Even with all that I've said, the ruling dynasty's influence might not be so disastrous except for one additional crucial fact. They consider themselves citizens of the world, not mere Americans. Thanks to their decades of internationalist propaganda, this may sound harmless enough to you until you realize that this means America is expendable to them. Furthermore, the most consistent ingredient of their ever-expanding monopolistic drive 
for over a century has been to smash certain people or companies or countries so that their share of what remains becomes a larger fraction of the total. Through World Wars I and II they brought Britain to its knees, thereby taking over the vast oil interests, including the Russian Baku oil fields and the Saudi Arabian oil fields, which had been owned and controlled by the British Government. Now the nightmarish fact is that it is America's turn to be sacrificed for the further advancement of the dynasty. For three decades they have been using various devices, foreign aid, direct and indirect, to build up their interests in Europe and elsewhere around the world at the United States taxpayers' expense. Our military secrets have been betrayed to our enemies and returned for favors to the dynasty and our economy has been bled almost dry. The crowning economic blow by which they plan to extract one last half trillion dollar profit before leaving the sinking American ship of state is the theft of America's gold supply and a resulting wild American inflation with the severest depression ever experienced in America. Part 2 The United States Dollar and the Federal Reserve My friends, as I mentioned earlier, the dynasty engineered the creation in 1913 of the so-called Federal Reserve by an act of Congress. The Federal Reserve's name exemplifies a favorite trick of the dynasty, which is the deliberate misnaming of activities and organizations in order to mislead the public as to their true nature. The Federal Reserve is not Federal. It is strictly a private central bank system controlled from the outset sixty years ago by dynasty interests. Nor when it was created did it possess any unique reserve of its own. At that time the United States Treasury directly owned the nation's gold supply and issued our money. The Federal Reserve was therefore initially just a sort of nationwide coordinator of banking activities, something which in itself, however, greatly increased the dynasty's control over America's economy. The dynasty deliberately brought about the Great Depression that began with the stock market crash of 1929 by means of one of their periodic corners of the gold market. Every time they corner the gold market a recession or depression results, its severity reflecting the extent of the corner. The reason for this is basically that by cornering a nation's gold they make it impossible for the nation to back up its currency with anything but promises. Confidence erodes, inflation erupts, business falters, and finally it all snowballs into a depression. That's what they did in 1929. And that's what they've done again now, except this time they have arranged for things to be much worse, with scarcity and skyrocketing inflation even during the Depression period itself. In 1935, with America in the depths of Depression, the dynasty brought the gold back that they had spirited abroad several years before selling it as foreign gold to the United States Government at the newly raised price of $35 an ounce. Earlier in 1934 they had also arranged for President, for President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, whom they controlled utterly, 
to confiscate the gold owned by individual United States citizens, paying them the old price of $20.67 an ounce. Then, incredibly, they induced President Roosevelt to turn over the nation's gold supply to the Federal Reserve System as a gift, if you please. This he obediently did, not even getting a receipt. These transactions were originally accomplished by Presidential Executive Order, being ratified afterward by the Congressional Gold Reserve Act of 1934. To give the dynasty their due, it should be noted that they always planned their moves far in advance. So when they named their central bank system the Federal Reserve in 1913, perhaps they were simply looking ahead to the mid-depression transactions which were planned for 20 years later, by which the Federal gold supply became the reserve of their private bank. 1934 also marked the beginning of a slow deterioration of the United States dollar, since we went off the true gold standard by having our dollars no longer convertible to gold. In 1965 the process intensified. That was the year in which our traditional 90% silver coins were replaced by the cladded copper funny money of today, and silver certificates were called in. In 1968 the two-tier gold system was established by an international agreement engineered by the dynasty. Up till then the price of gold was fixed at the official price of $35 per ounce. The two-tier gold system added a free market which would be used for private trading and where gold prices would move up or down according to supply and demand. Thus. A means now existed whereby gold prices could rise with interesting profit possibilities. However, the central banks, such as the Federal Reserve, were forbidden from gold trading on the open market. On August 15, 1971, President Nixon declared war on the dollar by divorcing it from its gold backing, unleashing inflation and also a stagnating trend and economic activity. In my book Conspiracy Against the Dollar I coined the word stagflation to describe the state of affairs, and it has since become quite a commonly used term in financial circles. On September 21, 1973, the stage was set for the full-fledged economic crisis we now face. On that day President Nixon signed into law Public Law 93-110, whose most important feature was not even mentioned in the press. It took title to the nation's gold away from the Federal Reserve where it had been since 1934, but it did say where it went. So the question was, where did the title go? That is, who now owned the nation's gold? Did it go back to the people of the United States from whence it came? Did it revert back to the office of the President? Did title return to the Treasury which had owned the nation's gold prior to 1934? Since then the Treasury has been merely a physical custodian of the gold, the Federal Reserve being the actual owner, that is, having title. Of course there is no logical reason why the law, Public Law 93-110, shouldn't have said where the title went upon being removed from the Federal Reserve. No reason that is except one. By leaving the law ambiguous, they set the stage for a manipulative shell game which the general public could hardly hope to follow or understand. To resolve this carefully contrived question of who had title to America's gold, an ad hoc joint committee was formed, its members as the, new, as the Wall Street Journal later revealed on November 15, 1973, were Arthur Burns, head of the Federal Reserve, George Schultz, then Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Kissinger, Secretary of State, 
Herbert Stein, then head of the Council of Economic Advisers, and Peter Flanagan, then the White House Staff on Economic Affairs, to the President. The rationale was that somewhere within this committee must presumably be the title to the gold. Therefore the committee as a whole could presumably take whatever actions relative to the gold that might come up. The committee was orchestrated by Paul Volcker, then Under Secretary of the Treasury for Monetary Affairs, who came directly from the dynasty's inner circles, as for that matter had all the other committee members. The next step came on November 13, 1973 when the two-tier gold system established in 1968 was eliminated. But what was eliminated was the old fixed official price market that existed before 1968, and what was retained was the relatively new floating price market on which it was agreed that central banks could now trade. Thus the world's currencies ceased to have any fixed relationship to one another and the world was plunged back into the floating currency anarchy of the 1930s. Really, exactly the anarchy that the Bret Woods Monetary Agreement of 1944 had been designed to end. The very next day, in a news conference, Arthur Burns and George Schultz commented respectively that the United States could now sell gold on the open market and that any such sales would be kept secret. On the same day, good, deliverable quality gold in Fort Knox began rolling out on Army trucks bound ultimately for private depositories in Europe. Only a little bit of low quality gold was left behind in Fort Knox. The private international banking interests of the dynasty had already arranged for the gold to be transferred to them for purposes of speculation. The great gold corner of 1973-74 had begun. Their plan, briefly stated, is to let gold rise to over $2,000 per ounce over the next year and a half. Once they finish cornering also the gold supply of the International Monetary Fund. At the current official price of $42.22 an ounce, the Federal Reserve gold supply amounts to about $11.5 billion, while that of the IMF comes to another $6.5 billion worth. When the price is officially repaid at the new high level, the dynasty presently intends to dump the gold back on the United States Government for a tidy windfall profit of over one-half trillion dollars, that is $500 billion on the Federal Reserve gold alone. By that time the American economy will have been thoroughly ravished, bled white by the dynasty's greed for power and profit. Thanks to their decades of internationalism which means putting worldwide interests of the dynasty first, regardless of the destructive consequences to America, we will be worse sitting ducks by far than we were for Pearl Harbor. Worse because it was to their interest to ensure that America could win World War II and provide the means for exploiting South Saudi Arabian oil, whereas by now they have transferred the wealth of America to other countries, including some who are America's enemies. They are bailing out, transferring the bulk of their assets to Europe and building mansions there to ride out the coming storm in America. When it's over, they expect to return and make their domination over us complete with a new Constitution of their own design. Part 3 Coming Events and How to Prepare for Them My friends, so far I've tried to alert you to the existence of the family dynasty that rules America behind the scenes. 
and I have briefly given you a broad outline of what they are up to, especially how they are deliberately bringing upon us a new severe depression. They are doing this just as they did in 1929 by cornering the nation's gold supply and destroying confidence in the dollar. And just as the Depression of the 1930s was followed by World War II, the Depression we now face will be followed by World War III. Having given you this essential background, now I want to get more specific about what to expect and when, and I want to suggest some of the things you can do to protect yourself. I want to make one thing as clear as I can, though. What I am about to do is simply to reveal information I have obtained from my confidential sources here and abroad, including those within the dynasty's empire. These are simply the plans of men and the emerging consequences of their actions. They are not like Biblical prophecies which cannot be changed. It is therefore my fervent personal hope and prayer that America will wake up before our free Republic is utterly destroyed as we know it. I personally believe that even at this late hour, and the hour is now very late, if we as a people will turn away from the idiot tube and turn back to God, our beloved country can still be saved. It will be a trial by fire, but I believe it can still be done. The recording you are listening to was made on October 11, 1974. Before projecting into the future, I want to comment on one very relevant recent development namely the visit which a delegation of Congressmen and newsmen made to Fort Knox to inspect the alleged gold there on September 23, 1974. This trip was completely unprecedented and was an historic first, except for one brief spur-of-the-moment visit by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1943. No one except for Federal Reserve and United States Treasury officials had ever been admitted to Fort Knox for such a purpose. This visit was arranged by the Government specifically in an attempt to answer my charges that the nation's gold, all or most of it, had been transferred to special international banking interests and physically removed. I had made these charges not only on radio programs, in interviews, and in lectures, but also in Congressional testimony before the Subcommittee on International Trade of the House Committee on Banking and Currency. It is a curious fact that while the Fort Knox visit was supposed to answer my charges, I was not invited to come along. It was merely a junket full of Congressmen and newspaper people having no expertise in gold. They were the only ones invited. Even so, their charade to fool the American people failed. A public expose of what happened at Fort Knox is now brewing, and the worldwide financial community that deals in gold already knows now that my charges were correct. America's gold supply has in effect been stolen, and the dollar is no longer backed up by anything at all. By late October or early, no early November 1974, certain banks scattered around the world are scheduled to collapse with obvious effects on public confidence. By early 1975 Europe will probably 
contained its inflation by backing its currencies once again with gold. The opposite will happen in the United States, though. After all, we don't even have any gold to back the dollar with now. Minting of coins in America will cease, and paper money will be issued in denominations less than a dollar for making change, and the so-called red-back dollars, which have been mentioned by Treasury Secretary William Simon as a nifty idea for several months, will soon appear. On January 1, 1975, as the law now stands, American citizens will once again be allowed to own gold for the first time since President Roosevelt confiscated it 40 years ago. In fact, under present law, President Ford has the option of granting this right of gold ownership to American citizens even earlier by sending his OK to Congress, but this probably won't happen. Indeed, even the January 1 date may be undone by legislation which is now being worked on in the United States Treasury Department. The real purpose of letting the public own gold is to help push prices up once the dynasty has cornered all but a few crumbs for itself, including silver, by the way, which tends to move upward in price along with gold. The problem is that the dynasty is presently having a bit more trouble than expected in snatching the major silver holdings of certain other Americans, and of course it wouldn't do to let prices go up before uh, they are ready. Sometime early in 1975, possibly earlier, uh, watch for the critical gold zoom signal. By this I mean an open market gold price which stays over $180 an ounce for several weeks. This will mean that the world gold corner by the manipulators is complete, and they are ready to let gold prices zoom toward the goal of over $2,000 an ounce. This will signal the start of the worst of the inflation unparalleled in the 20th century to last about a year and a half. This will wipe out many people's earnings and life savings and is what you must protect yourself against. The first quarter of 1975 will also see the beginnings of near mass starvation in America as deepening unemployment and skyrocketing prices are made worse by cruel food shortages. I say cruel because they, like the rest of the dismal picture, are manipulated and deliberate, which is why my sources have enabled me to publicly warn of these coming shortages as early as June 1974. Massive shipments of American food abroad in recent years, including grains from our already depleted resources and reserves, have been engineered behind the scenes by dynasty interests to help set the stage for this. The dynasty is profitably feeding others, including America's avowed enemies, and letting us starve. As of now, President Ford has just canceled some massive grain shipments to Russia, a hopeful sign, but Government figures explain that somehow Russia has already succeeded in buying far more from the United States than the limits she had agreed to in view of the tightness of American supplies. Will our leaders try to get back any of this extra food? quietly obtained by Russia, food that Americans will soon need desperately, perhaps the vigorous reaction of Secretary of State Henry Kissinger provided a clue. He has been quoted as saying, it was probably 
a misunderstanding between bureaucracies. By mid-1975, according to statements made in the summer of 1974, America will be in the midst of political and economic chaos, perhaps better described as panic. These words were presented as warnings, supposedly, by David Rockefeller, Chairman of the Mammoth Chase Manhattan Bank in New York City. At about the same time, Arthur Burns, head of the Federal Reserve System, issued statements warning that the consequences of continued unchecked inflation could well be a significant decline in economic and political freedom for the American people. This is the same Arthur Burns who admitted in a letter of June 28, 1974, published in the Congressional Record of July 18, 1974, that the assets of the Federal Reserve System no longer include gold, even though the published financial statements of the Federal Reserve do list gold as an asset. Of course, having said these things in the summer of 1974, people issuing such statements will be in a perfect position to impress the public with their wisdom, saying, I told you so, if their predictions come true a year later. But beware! Jay Gould, after he had cornered the gold in 1869, said, and I quote here, I regret very much the depression in financial circles, but I predicted it long ago. I was in no way instrumental in producing the panic. He lied. I might add that should Nelson Rockefeller be confirmed as Vice President by Congress in late 1974, my sources claim that he will be President by June 1975, Gerald Ford having been kicked out of office by that time. By the middle of 1976 the game plan is for the price of gold to reach the manipulator's goal of over $2,000 an ounce, and then it will be officially pegged at $2,000 an ounce after two or three intermediate jumps above the 19 74 level of $42.22 per ounce. Once gold is officially pegged at the new price, $2,000 an ounce, inflation will end and deflation begin. Prices and interest rates will stabilize again. The stock market, reflecting this new phase, will at last bottom out at around 100 to 200 on the Dow, and start back up, and bankruptcies will cease. In other words, America will begin its recovery from this Chinese-type inflation and severe depression, nothing like it had ever been experienced up until then. One to two years later, between mid-1977 and mid-1978 roughly, World War III will begin. The United States, its military secrets betrayed, and its economic strength sapped by the dynasty's greedy manipulations, will suffer a nuclear Pearl Harbor attack. The Panama Canal will provide the excuse for the war, in which America itself will be the prime battleground. According to my very reliable intelligence sources on this matter, the Republic of Guyana, next to Venezuela in South America, has already been turned into another Cuba, with atomic missiles aimed at the Gatun Lux of the Panama Canal and at our cities here in the United States. Of course, our government 
which dances to the tune called by the dynasty, refuses even to investigate seriously my charges on this score. The war will not be of the science fiction to our variety. It will last for some 13 months, and it will kill over half of America's people. The reduced and destitute population of America will, if all proceeds according to the dynasty's plan, be easy for them to then dominate completely. And if they can then engineer rebuilding their assets in America with foreign taxpayers' money as they rebuilt their European interests with American money after World War II, their power will ultimately rise to a new, higher plateau. Conquest of the world will then be within sight. My friends, the events I have outlined based on the dynasty's plans are hardly a source of cheer, but at least having some idea what to expect and when you can start preparing. And, my friends, I would waste no time in doing so. As I see it, there are three basic areas to take care of in your preparations. In order of priority they are 1. Necessities, 2. Liquid Assets, and 3. Savings and Financial Reserves. The relative amount you should devote to each area depends, however, on your own particular circumstances. Area 1. Necessities. Make sure above all else that you will have the necessities on hand that you will need to survive, first during the Stagflation Depression era and then during the war to follow. You must consider at least five basic kinds of necessities – shelter, food, water, fuel, and medical supplies. Concerning shelter, be sure that your house is in good repair generally before the Depression arrives. In particular, be sure that it is properly insulated. Looking ahead to the war, arrange if you can to have a retreat as far as possible from the target areas in America, where you can ride out the 13-month nuclear war. The best thing, of course, is to be in another country outside of the war zone, such as Europe or Canada. Failing that, which most Americans cannot do, the retreat should simply be as far as possible from the probable target areas. It should also be upwind of the nearest target areas based on prevailing winds so that any nuclear blast fallout will tend to drift away from the retreat instead of toward it. Major cities and distribution centers, military installations, and nuclear power plants should all be considered probable targets. You may be able to build your retreat from scratch with an underground fallout shelter, a well, air filters, and so forth. Or you may have relatives who live in a good area who would pool their resources with yours, preparing their basement to take care of all of you when the time comes. Or perhaps you have a camping vehicle that would serve as a temporary mobile retreat. Now concerning food, the key word is storability. You want to stock up now on foods to eat later when food becomes scarce. Most canned foods keep well for many months, so stock up now because store shelves will soon have increasingly large and frequent empty spaces. For a longer term storage, periods of 5 to 10 years and more, dehydrated and freeze-dried foods 
are available from certain specialty stores which are specially packaged in large cans. Garden seeds, uh, like food itself, will become scarcer, so get a supply now if you have space for a garden. Seeds for sprouting can provide you with a good source of fresh vegetable protein uh, during the non-gardening season. You may wish to check with health food stores about some of these items. Turning to the matter of water, be sure you have a well, if possible, at your wartime retreat. At your home the municipal water supply could become polluted or even cease. At some point during the severe economic breakdown are due to the Chinese-type inflation depression. The easiest thing to do here is probably to revive the old rain barrel as a backup source of water, that is, collect the rain water that runs off your roof in a barrel. Any time you suspect there are germs in your water, boil the water, then I'm told uh, you can add up to 8 drops of liquid chlorine bleach, such as Clorox, per gallon of water to kill the germs. Next comes fuel. America now depends heavily on insecure sources such as Saudi Arabia for oil, from which we obtain gasoline, our fuel oil, diesel fuel, and much of our electric power. Our oil source uh, can be distorted or disrupted at any time by a cold strike, a Mideast war, or another Arab oil embargo, which by the way could result from Arab unwillingness to sell its oil for worthless American dollars. Thus you should reduce your vulnerability to interruption of the oil supply. If you can store them safely, build reserves of any fuels that are critical for you. If you have a furnace that uses fuel oil or natural gas, its blowers and controls are probably electric, so you should try to arrange safe standby means of operating in the event of power failure. If you have a fireplace, make sure that it is in a safe working order. In an emergency it can provide heat and it can be used for makeshift cooking. Lastly, don't forget about needed medical supplies. Be sure to have adequate supplies on hand of any special medications uh, that are needed on a continuing or recurring basis, and have a good stock of assorted first aid supplies. Area 2. Liquid Assets That is, cash on hand or readily available. Stay as liquid as you can. Don't tie up your funds in investments or property that you can't get your money back out of easily. Important: Collect all coins now in circulation, whether cladded copper or otherwise. Any coinage is worth more than paper, and you will be able to buy more with your coins during the Depression than with the red backs and paper change that will be issued by early 1975. Keep your cash in a safe place such as a safe deposit box or in private depositories. If you insist on depositing part of your funds in banks, do it in short-term certificates of deposit with interest rates that rise with inflation. Make the certificates of deposit as short-term as you possibly can. If you wish to obtain a mortgage, a bank loan, a loan on your life insurance, or other long-term loans at fixed interest rates, that's quite all right. Those are good ways to make cash available to you that is otherwise tied up. But if you do this, be sure to maintain an adequate cash reserve fund to cover your loan commitments just in case the hidden rulers should decide to change the rules in the middle of their game plan. Area 3. Savings and Financial Reserves You want these assets, left over after taking care of necessities and adequate ready cash, to rise with inflation, so that you will not be wiped out by the time the stagflation era ends. 
Here is a checklist of do's and don'ts with your savings uh, during this period. Silver coins, gold coin collections, silver bars of any size. These are good long-term investments since their value will increase to keep pace with inflation. They can be insured and may even be acceptable as loan collateral. Be sure to store them safely in bank or private depositories under correct or assumed names. One cautionary note here. The hidden rulers may seek to nationalize uh, our gold and silver just as they did with our gold in 1934. So pay cash and don't give your name to the seller. If you can store your gold and silver outside the United States, so much the better, since it won't be nationalized there and you are more certain of getting your money out of it. Foreign Currencies European currencies will soon be backed by gold again and will be strong but be careful of these unless you plan to travel abroad or use Europe for a retreat in World War III, since currency controls may be reimposed. Fire Insurance Increase your protection to keep up with inflation. Storable food and other basic commodities. Consider investing in these for barter or sale, commodities that you would be able to use or work with are the safest here. Real Estate In view of the pending war, it is probably wisest in general to avoid buying real estate other than your own home and remote property for your retreat. Pensions and Annuities like other fixed incomes, will gradually lose their value. Stocks are in general not safe during this period except for certain gold stocks, since the September visit to Fort Knox showed the world that the United States no longer has gold with which to depress gold market prices. Bonds are no good, even safe government bonds because their interests and capital are payable in steadily deteriorating dollars. Savings accounts, savings and loan deposits, life insurance, and annuities all appreciate in value far too slowly to keep up with current inflation and therefore should be examined thoroughly in each individual case by a competent financial advisor. My friends, this concludes my discussion of what lies ahead for America in the next few years and my suggestions about what you can do to protect yourself individually, that is, yourself and your family. As for what we might all be able to accomplish working together, that's a different matter. That's beyond the scope of this talk, but I have to confess that there is where my real hopes lie, for only when America is once again made safe and free for all of us will it truly be safe and free for any of us. Thank you, and God bless each and every one of you.